chapter nine. Up until this point, we talked about solutions. Uh, the last time we finished up on talking about uh, different types of concentrations, such as molarity, mass, mass percent, um, also dilutions, when we basically dilute down the solution from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So we're gonna finish up by just talking about some properties of solutions. First off, we're gonna talk about a semi-mirable uh, membrane. And basically it's a membrane that allows certain size molecules, such as solvent molecules, uh, to sort of pass through while it kind of prevents others from also coming through. It basically kind of works by size, although you know you might not be able to kind of see uh, the opening. There's like a certain size opening, which will allow certain size molecules to be able to really pass through. Obviously, if you have something that's a little bit bigger there, it's going to run into a little trouble of trying to get through there. Uh, much like sort of like cell membranes, you know, they act as sort of membranes, allowing certain things to kind of flow in and out of the cell. Uh, that's sort of what these semi pyramidal membranes mean. Again, it means, you know, some things can penetrate through basically and kind of get to the other side. Other things cannot. Colloids are much larger than solute particles in a solution. Remember, the solute particles are the smaller part of the solution. A lot of times the substances that we dissolve in the larger part, which is the solvent. Colloids are large molecules like proteins and groups of molecules or ions. They are homogeneous mixtures that do not separate or settle out. Homogeneous, you remember, means that basically everything mixes, everything looks the same throughout. Uh, they're small enough to pass through filters, but they're too large to pass through sort of these membranes. So for example, some colloids are things like milk, uh, mayonnaise, fog, you know, are some examples of some colloids. Uh, suspensions, on the other hand, are heterogeneous. And if you remember, heterogeneous means we see things in different phases. We see different sort of layers, if you will. And these are non-uniform mixtures. They're very different than solutions or colloids. Um, they often can be seen with sort of the naked eye. These are really large things that, you know, can really get trapped by filters and membranes as well. Not going to let those things kind of go through. Uh, things like milk and magnesia, where you have to really kind of shake uh, the, the solution there to kind of get it to really mix. Uh, oh, orange juice with some pulp in it, you know, are some examples of that. Um, perhaps some medication you have maybe gotten or seen as sort of a suspension where, you know, you got to kind of mix it up really good, um, you know, to make sure that, you know, it's all mixed and ready to go. Here's a, a picture of some of the different uh, types of solutions that we sort of talked about. Uh, solution, which again is our solute and our solvent, our colloids, which are those homogeneous type of mixtures, and really our suspensions, which are heterogeneous type mixtures. Uh, you can see here that the solution and the colloid uh, really don't settle out to the bottom. You know, they float around. While we do see some settling of suspensions, Hence why, for example, again, the milk of magnesia, you gotta really kind of mix it to kind of disperse it through the different phases. Uh, here's our filter through some filter paper. Again, we see our solutions, no problem coming through the filter paper. We also see colloids passing through. Again, here are suspensions getting sort of caught up there on the filter paper. This is a semi pyramidal membrane. Again, it's sort of like a bag. And again, uh, it's kind of like what I drew earlier, you can't necessarily see the holes, if you will, or sort of the pathways or, or paths to the other side there, uh, but there are, and you can see again, kind of our smaller molecules, solution molecules are able to pass sort of in and out of the membrane. Here though, we do see our suspensions and our colloids being, you know, not able to necessarily pass through the actual membrane. So then let's talk a little bit about osmosis and dialysis. Um, osmosis is basically the sort of process where solvent molecules move from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. In essence, they're trying to basically dilute the more concentrated side. So if we kind of do a little drawing here, say we have sort of a cylinder here and it's sort of separated by a membrane in the middle here. 
And let's just say on one side we have pure water, sort of pure H2O. On the other side, we have some salt water. And the process of osmosis is going to be the pure water, which is less concentrated, is going to basically start the flow across the membrane to the other side to where the salt water is. And it will continue basically to flow to that side until it basically hits what is known as osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure is basically the pressure that's being exerted down by the atmosphere. And at some point, that flow of water molecules, for example, will be hitting that osmotic pressure and they will basically be equal to each other. And at that point, we will stop the flow of water from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So osmotic pressure is based on the amount of particles that are in solution. Uh, sometimes osmotic pressure is measured by what is sometimes referred to as osmolarity. Osmolarity is basically I times the molarity. M is the molarity, which is our moles per liter. What is I? Well, I is basically the number of particles in that particular solution. So what that means is if you had a solution of sodium chloride, it would break apart when it's in the solution as sodium ions and chloride ions. The I value here would be two. One sodium ion, one chloride ion gives you two total particles. If you had a calcium chloride, it would break apart into one calcium ion and two chloride ions. I here would be three in this case. Again, three total ions. So how does that affect sort of osmotic pressure or pressure? Well, if we had the same one molar solution of sodium chloride and a one molar solution of calcium chloride, you may think that they both might exert the same osmotic pressure. But if we calculate the osmolarity of sodium chloride, again, being I times the molarity, which would be two times one molar, would give us two osmolarity, or osmol is sometimes referred to. If we did our calcium chloride, I times the molarity would be three times one, and it would have a three for its osmolarity. The calcium chloride would basically have a greater osmotic pressure because there's more particles basically dissolved in the solution. So the greater the number of particles in the solution, the greater the osmotic pressure. Something like pure water has really no particles dissolved in solution because it doesn't break apart. It's covalent, so you don't produce ions or anything like that, and it has basically no osmotic pressure. Here's a, uh, a much more fancier picture of what I sort of drew there, but again, uh, we're going to get no more flow of really solvent molecules because we got this osmotic pressure sort of pushing back down on it. That brings us back to here, for example, you know, what is sometimes referred to as reverse osmosis. What's reverse osmosis? Well, reverse osmosis is when pretty much osmotic pressure has been hit, but you decide we're going to apply a pressure greater than the atmospheric pressure. So what would that do? Well, if we apply a pressure sort of greater than that uh, osmotic pressure or atmospheric pressure, it's going to basically force everything back the other way. And that's what's known as reverse osmosis. And again, if you have a nice little filter sort of there, as it's forcing everything back the other way, you could really end up with some nice pure water and obviously remove some contaminants uh, that may be in that particular solution. Let's also talk about three different types of solutions. One is known as isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic solutions. Let's start with isotonic solution. Isotonic solutions exert the same osmotic pressure as body fluids. Most IV bags are isotonic solutions. What does that mean? Well, it means that if we take a, the classic example of a red blood cell, RBC, a red blood cell, and we put it into a isotonic solution, 
basically the blood cell is going to act as a membrane and it's going to allow flow of sort of solution in and out of the cell basically at an equal rate and it's going to be perfectly fine which is why IV bags are isotonic so when they give it to you it doesn't mess up your body because probably if you're getting an IV you have some issues happening to begin with so they obviously wouldn't want to give you something that's going to mess up your cells so a lot of IV bags obviously contain isotonic solutions what are isotonic solutions well isotonic solutions are basically a 0.9 percent sodium chloride solution or sometimes referred to as a saline solution doesn't necessarily have to be sodium chloride it could be like potassium chloride or something like that um, and that's like mass to volume percent and a five percent glucose solution or sugar type solution these two are basically considered isotonic which means if you have those type of solutions you're going to get this situation here. Everybody's gonna be okay, cells are gonna be okay. We're gonna have equal flow in and out basically of the cell. We do start to run into a little bit of trouble if we get into perhaps a hypotonic solution. Hypo means lower than. So this is a solution that is lower in concentration than an isotonic solution. So what would happen in that particular case? Well, if we take our same red blood cell and we put it now though into our hypotonic solution, what that means is the solution outside of the cell is less concentrated than the solution inside the cell. So what is going to happen? Well, osmosis is going to happen. And basically what the outside of the cell is gonna basically do is, it's going to rush in all the water and solution into the cell. Remember osmosis goes from a slower concentration to a higher concentration. So again here, lower concentration on the outside of the cell, higher concentration inside the cell. That's not a good situation because you know, you're red blood cell is now going to swell a lot and at some point some fine artwork here is going to burst and i'm assuming that's probably not a very good thing so we typically will see a swelling we'll see it burst this is what's known as hemolysis in this particular case and again it's through that process of osmosis basically rushing the cell with all this excess fluid and obviously causing it to swell and again eventually burst Another type of solution, which is known as hypertonic, hyper means more than or greater than, that means that the solution outside of the cell is higher concentrated than the solution inside. So again, if we kind of draw our red blood cell here, and again, this is gonna be hypertonic. What this means is in this particular case, outside of the cell, as I just mentioned, is higher in concentration than inside the cell. So what does the cell think? Well, the cell thinks I need to go and start diluting outside of the cell. And basically everything starts rushing the solution and water out of the cell. What's that going to do? Well, it's going to basically shrink your cell. A really bad drawn sort of situation there. And we're gonna get the cell to shrink and that's known as crenation, also not a great situation to occur. So isotonic has the same osmotic pressure as basically body fluids, no problem for cells that act like a membrane, again, gonna allow stuff to flow in and out basically at the same rate. Hypotonic solution, gonna cause everything to rush into the cell, cause it to swell, cause it to burst which is hemolysis, hypertonic, the cell is going to try to do its best to dilute out the solution. And in the process is going to cause itself to shrink and go through crenation. Again, these numbers here are really important and is sort of your baseline numbers to decide, you know, is something isotonic, hypotonic or hypertonic. So for example, if we put a red blood cell in these following solutions. Let's say we put it in a 
5% sodium chloride solution, a 2% glucose solution, a 0.9% sodium chloride solution, and let's say we put it in pure water. What will happen to these red blood cells? Will they be okay? Will they shrink? Will they swell? Why don't you uh, take a moment here and see what you come up with. Okay, so hopefully you've taken a moment here to decide what's going to happen in each of these cases. So let's talk about it. Well, first off, we have a 5% sodium chloride solution. 5% is greater than 0.9. And that means that this would then be a hypertonic solution. That means that our red blood cell here will end up going through this process. And this process would mean that it is going to shrink and go through crenation. 2% glucose, 2% glucose is less than 5%. That means that this is considered a hypotonic solution, which means we're going to go through this situation here. And that means that the cell is going to swell and burst, which is known as crenation. 0.9% glucose is, I'm sorry, 0.9% sodium chloride is 0.9% sodium chloride. This is isotonic, which means we're good. Osmotic pressure is good. Cell is going to be a-okay, hopefully. And lastly, pure water. Well, pure water is not isotonic. So sometimes people think water can't be bad. But as we just talked about in the last slide, pure water has no osmotic pressure. Having no osmotic pressure means it's actually hypotonic. It's going to be less concentrated than the red blood cell, which means this situation is actually what's going to occur. It's going to swell and it's going to burst and go through hemolysis. So remember that, you know, sometimes we think about water, ah, it's just water, it's okay. But in this particular case, because water has no particles in it, has no osmotic pressure, it's actually gonna be more of a hypotonic solution. So you do need to know, obviously, isotonic, hypotonic, hypertonic. You do need to know these two numbers as they are really the ones that will allow you to make that determination. Here's a table, you have a similar one in your book there, but again, talking about what we just talked about, the osmolarity is basically the same, is equal to body fluids, hypotonic, it is less than, hypertonic, it is greater than, um, and then here's our osmotic pressure as well, greater than in hypertonic, less than in hypotonic, and the osmotic effect on the cell Water will flow in and out equally in an isotonic. As we talked about, we get a net flow out of the cell in a hypertonic because it's trying to dilute the outside while we get a net flow of water into the cell in a hypotonic as it's trying to dilute the cell. Here's a picture prettier than what I drew there, but uh, I like to refer to this as isotonic, nice looking donut hypotonic, uh, we have our jelly donut where it burst, and hypertonic donut hole, might as well go with that, donut hole as it shrinks down there, so it's a good way to remember it, donuts never hurt, I suppose. Uh, here's just a flow table of a lot of stuff we talked about, we obviously uh, did not talk about any of this stuff, so you don't have to worry about that, we didn't really talk too much about that, we touched upon this, these guys we did, and obviously, uh, that osmotic pressure we did as well. And let me just erase that little there for a second. And again, you should have a similar table in, in your book as well. Lastly here, dialysis is a process similar, process similar to osmosis. It allows for small solute molecules and ions basically to uh, sort of pass through. A lot of times in a lab or something, we may use like a dialysis bag. And it's kind of the same idea. You know, there's like little holes in these bags. You can't really necessarily see it. 
but it's going to again allow certain things to pass through other things again if we kind of just blow up the little hole there other things that are too big not going to be able to pass through again to get to the other side things that are kind of small enough able to really go and go through it a lot of times we may use a dialysis bag in an experiment uh, to perhaps get something like a protein in in the right environment you can put it into the environment like it'll be the same ph for example as say in the body or something like that and you can run your experiment we obviously use uh, our kidneys and stuff like that and bodies you know to sort of filter out things uh, in our in our body that we don't want like waste products and stuff like that uh, this is very similar i think to an experiment that you guys do there um, you basically put a bunch of stuff into a dialysis bag such as this and every so often you test the water on the outside. And the purpose of testing the water on the outside is to see what has been able to pass through the dialysis bag and make it to the outside. And I think of that experiment at the very end, you pop the bag open and you see what was left in the bag that was not able to obviously make it to the other side. That should conclude uh, chapter nine now. That was just the last little bit of chapter nine. Again, the previous recordings from the lectures are up there as well, including properties of solutions, concentration, and um, also about solubility and, and things of that nature that we talked about. And that will wrap up chapter nine, and I'll see you next time.